Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Visser, and in this podcast, I will take you on a journey through the wilderness of scientific research and experiential knowledge. Together, we will clear a path to optimizing health, well-being, and longevity. I am a former Minister of Health and Sports with a PhD in Medical Sciences, a published researcher in the fields of obesity, lifestyle medicine, and longevity. I started my career path over three decades ago as a doctor of chiropractic. I'm excited to share my methods, know-how, and experience with you. So please join me on the Visser Podcast. Welcome to the Visser Podcast. Today, we're gonna to be talking about optimizing your sleep. This is episode number 11. This is part of the foundation work that we're doing. So episode one to 12 is the foundation work. We talk about the gut biome. We talk about nutrition. We talk about exercise, anxiety, stress, massive depression, and we talk about, I think sleep is one of the key factors in the foundation work. Foundation work is there for a reason. If you don't have it right, then why fine tune? I mean, you gotta have the basics right. So we have to have the basics right. That's why the foundation work is so important. And that's why I dedicated those first 12 chapters to the foundation work. That is getting the basics right, knowing what tools we can use to get the basics right. So why is sleep so important? Sleep is where we reset our brain. We heal the body. We basically, you know, take our memories. We've, we digest what we've learned. We improve our cardiovascular system. We optimize our immune system and it's huge. It's, it's massive what we do in sleep. So we have to have quality and quantity of sleep. Now there's two main types of sleep. There's REM sleep, you've heard rapid eye movement sleep, and there's non REM sleep. And in non REM sleep, you have four stages. Okay. So every time we sleep, we want to get through the stages all the way to stage three and four, which is the deep sleep and then we come back out. These stages go in cycles of 90 minutes, which we'll talk about in a second. So really, I think if you wanna look a little bit further into this, I would recommend Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, it's a good one. And let's, let's go into the basics of sleep right now before we start with, we'll have, you know, we'll go over tools that you'll need to use to sleep better, to optimize your sleep, because it's about optimizing the sleep critical part in our life. We spend a lot of time sleeping and we have everything going against our sleep. The technology we use today, our phone, the lighting system, just living in this modern era. I think it's like, you know, it, it's set up to basically sabotage our sleep. <laughs> So we have to kind of get back to nature. We have to get back in touch with our circadian. So we're going to be talking about all of that. So let's go to the basics of sleep. Okay. In REM sleep, what we get is vivid hallucinations, visions. We're most creative and we wake up a lot of times from REM sleep with solutions, solutions that we were thinking about during the day. So REM sleep has that kind of play with us. It's kind of between waking and deep sleeping in, and it's where a lot of activity happens. So there's a play in the brain for dominance every night. And it's our, our, you know, cycle of sleep. So the cycle of sleep is 90 minutes. Okay. And the ratio changes. So how much REM sleep, how much non REM sleep do we get in this ratio, depending on the time of night, 
how good we sleep, how deep we sleep, etc. But there's kind of this battle going on between non-REM and REM sleep at different stages. And what we mean with a 90-minute cycle is that you'll start off at, at REM and then you'll drop into stage one of non-REM sleep, then stage two, stage three and four, and then move your way back up, back to REM sleep. That is one cycle, and that is 90 minutes. And we keep doing this from when we sleep till when we wake up. And usually in that 90 minutes, we'll go to the bathroom and, you know, have to go pee or something. That's in that REM. So we, we come back up, we surface back up, and we go back down. And when we're in that REM sleep, we're, a lot of times we can be paralyzed, kind of awake, but still paralyzed. Our, our body functions isn't functioning we can't move we'll talk about what that means too so if you know this sleep these cycles are all tied to our circadian rhythm okay which also tells us when to go to sleep so how wh where does our circadian rhythm get triggered now the biggest trigger for our circadian rhythm is light now we live in artificial light, which confuses the heck out of our rhythm, and it can't. So we have to go back to really triggering it, giving it our circadian rhythm, its north star, meaning, you know, setting it on course. And how do we how do we do this? Well, first of all, I think we have to look at okay, what how does this light work? What does it control? What, what mechanisms are at work here? So when we look at light hitting the eyes, it hits the retina, converts to an electrical pulse, goes to the hypothalamus, um, which is kind of the internal thermostat. It hits these group of cells, the supraic nucleus, SCN, which controls the circadian rhythm. And it communicates to two parts of the brain that are, you know, kind of very important. The pineal glands, which secrete the melatonin. Now, from melatonin, we know that's the part that, you know, puts us to sleep. And I'm not talking about melatonin supplements. We'll have a talk about that. But our natural melatonin. And then the second part is the brain stem. You know, these fibers, the reticular activating system. It has to do with arousal, consciousness, and the off switch shuts off that consciousness, pawns. It plays a, it also plays a role in muscle relaxation. So you have decrease of serotonin, dopamine is decreased, acetylcholine is decreased, and then you have an increase in GABA, which is a major, major inhibitor of communication and the prefrontal cortex. And no hy hypothalamus um, activity so this is where you kind of your body shuts off so we're talking about you know the first part where your body starts shutting off and where it's shut off and how it shuts off and how light kind of triggers all this so how do we measure sleep how do we how do you do this well we do this with with a electroencephalogram graph sorry and we measure the electrical activity so we're in the theta wave right before we go to sleep theta waves are the dominant frequency in healing high creative states that we talked about before in REM bring emotional experiences good or bad memory retrieval and encoding new memories into thoughts okay so this is the initial wave before we go to bed so getting into REM, starting to get into REM sleep. So if we look at the waves, the different waves that we have, the brain waves, we've got the gamma waves, which are greater than 25 hertz. This is the fastest brain wave. It's responsible for learning, memory, processing new information. You have beta waves, greater than 13 hertz. The brain wave, most prominent when we awake and problem solving concentrating this is what we use beta waves for alpha waves is between 8 and 13 hertz this wave often occurs when we're awake resting comfortably you know responding to any visual stimulus or activity thinking about something so as you see we start coming down in 
the hertz in the waves. And here we hit theta waves. Theta waves is what we're talking about now. It's just, just before sleep. And so we're down to four to eight hertz. These occur when a person is in a light sleep stage or dreaming, as well as in a relaxed meditative state of the mind, commonly referred to as being on autopilot. Okay, so that's the theta wave. Theta wave then eventually goes to delta waves. This is deep sleep. This is less than four hertz. These brain waves happening during deep sleep stages, thinking three and four. Okay, so this is what we measure when we're doing these analysis on sleep and when we're using when we're using the you know recording the electrical waves. So what happens? Okay, so when we go from, when we get into non-REM one, stage one, we're in light sleep. And how do you know this? You know, this is where you get the hypnic jerks. You, you're kind of sleeping and you're, you're doing that, or, or parts of your body are jerking. This is when you know you're in non-REM one. Okay, muscle twitch, you get some hallucinations, they call this hypnagogic hallucinations. And this is where you can like see a ghost or see, you see things. And this is non-REM one. So then after that, you kind of sink into non-REM two. These are spindles and K complexes. Activity peak information wants to wake you up. So you, you start getting inputs of information that you, your body, your brain starts to suppress because it wants to wake you up and it's kind of like suppressing it. This is where the suppression happens to take you into non-REM three and four, which is a low frequency, high amplitude, entering the state of data waves. This is where growth hormone is released, the body is repaired, sleep disorders occur here, sleepwalking, bedwetting. So this is a very important stage for us to get in, not because of the disorders, but because of the growth hormone release and the body repair. So this is, this is a big one. And then from there, we kind of go back and move up the stages back to REM. And this then includes the 90 minute cycle. So when we're looking at improving our sleep, you know, in general, six tips in general, before we get to real tools in general, regularity is king time, you know, to get up time to go down to bed, it basically reinforces our circadian system. Okay, temperature. This is a big one. When, when we get ready to go to bed, our temperature actually drops. And this is our core temperature it drops to a degree or two. And so it's better to sleep in a colder room. It's better to keep the temperature down. This will really help us sleep better and deeper. If we have covers over us, make sure the covers are loose enough to where we can, in the middle of the night, be able to stick out a hand or stick out a foot. This is where our body naturally seeks to get cooler, and you know, pulls it back in if we want to get warmer. Why? Because like we discussed before, bottom of the cheeks, bottom of the hands, bottom of the feet, is where we have the most control of our internal temperature gauge or you know core temperature and why is that? because this is where the arteries and the veins meet and we're able to influence that in connecting to our core temperature meter so that's temperature light cut the lights out to regulate melatonin before and while sleeping so while you're sleeping from like 10 to 4 or 5 in the morning, it needs to be pitch black. No lights, no telephone lights, nothing. Everything needs to be out. In the morning when we wake up, key, go outside within the first 30 minutes and get an exposure of 10 minutes of sunlight. And if there's no sunlight, it's overcast, doesn't matter. Get that light in. Not through windows, not with sunglasses or anything like that. Filtering the light, you need to get real light in your eyes on your face, body. So go outside for people that live in, in, you know, the cold weathers, same thing, get more outside right away. And this basically starts your circadian clock. It basically resets it, says, okay, we're in morning time. Okay, so light is a huge one. And at night, 
what you can do and we'll talk about this see the sunset and dim the lights but we're, we're gonna go into that um, number four if you wake you know don't force you back to don't don't force yourself back to sleep take a walk go do something make sure you come back to sleep you don't want to be fighting in bed to get back to sleep and you know this is after let's say 20 minutes if you're trying to get to sleep and 20 minutes you see like okay i'm not getting back to sleep get up move around watch out with caffeine consumption alcohol consumption before you go to bed hours before it could affect your your sleep if you're immune to it fine but this is one of the things you need to check you need a wind down routine you know and and we'll go into subroutines here because the wind down is important the wind down you know a lot of times we'll go to bed with our head full and we'll sit there and start as soon as we rest as soon as we let go our mind starts working oh my god i need to do this i need to finish that i've got an issue with my daughter i've got an issue with my mom i got this i gotta make this call me all of a sudden this list of stuff things we haven't dealt with things that are on the table still that come up and we can't get to bed so we need a wind down routine so we need to make sure that we don't create a paired association in bed with anything else. So with stress, you know, we need to unpair that behavior. Working in bed, unpair that behavior. Bed is really for sleeping. We need to, you know, get our body used to when we hit the bed, it's about sleeping. It's not about worries. It's not about distraction. It's not about work. It's not about etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we need to kind of, you know, dissociate when we go to bed. So before you go to sleep, this is the subroutine. We need to basically do a brain dump. Okay. How do we do this? Well, plan in time to worry on purpose and make a plan. So your brain stops nagging. Okay. 15 minutes max, write stuff down. Certain time of the day, take 15 minutes and kind of write down go over what needs to be done what's left all the worrying get it out so that your brain can chill so that you can feel like okay i've got it handled what i can't what i can't handle i set it off but it's all written down it's ready to go i don't have to think about it okay make this a time during the day not at night go through your list highlight actionable worries okay so Highlight the actionable board. Set a reminder to take steps. Acceptance, okay? Some problems cannot be fixed right away. You need to accept that. Shifting your focus to gratitude and brain dump. So these are kind of six things that you do to kind of get yourself ready for bed so that when you get to bed, you don't have the extra issue to deal with of your brain just going okay we've got lists we've got all this stuff we need to go through it no okay so let's go over some tools so and it's going to be an overview and it's we're going to go a little bit deeper into this now with these tools so like we said before we drop the temperature by one to two degrees when we go to bed our sleep quality is determined by the other basics what we eat how we exercise, the play on light and dark. We're gonna talk about this again. A wind down routine. And we can do, we can look at adenosine antagonists like caffeine. Also look at alcohol. We need to look at that. There are six different supplements that we'll talk about that you can use to help this. And then of course, if all this doesn't work, see a sleep specialist, go to psychiatrist, go to psychologist, work this out because sleep is that important. You need to get good sleep. So let's talk about the 24 hour cycle. Okay. The first cyclical period is upon waking. Okay. Upon waking opposite than when we go to sleep, temperature goes up one to two degrees. So your body starts heating up. Okay. You get an elevation in cortisol, which increases your metabolism, starts you moving. Like I said before, it's important to view sunlight 30 to 60 minutes max after waking. Uh, triggers the, the cortisol, sets in motion a timer 
to sleep later. Okay. Artificial light or full light will disrupt sleep. We talked about this. On cloudy days, you need to go longer outside. So really the prescription on a clear day would be five minutes of sun exposure. On a cloudy day, we're talking 20, 10 to 20 minutes of exposure through and not through windows, really outside. This is for Northern countries. A couple of things you can get if you really need extra light and you're not able to get it outside, it's pitch black, whatever. Cheap ways to do this, get a ring light that we're using for recordings, you know, for, for podcast recordings. Use that is not optimum, but it, it helps. And the other one would be to, you know, get a lead tablet. And those are pretty, pretty cheap to get and you can use it. So this is where we need to, you know, we need this because initially in the morning, what we want to do is suppress the melatonin, wash out the adenosine that is still in our system, start increasing adrenaline and dopamine. And with the sunlight, the initial sunlight, this is what the end starting our clock saying, okay, this is the start of our clock gets set, the clock then determines what our sleep time will be and it's, it calibrates itself every day. So it is important. Okay, so when we look at caffeine, you know, some people, I'm, I'm used to caffeine. I, you know, in my days of studying or non-studying, <laughs> I used caffeine to stay up and, and burn the midnight oil and I got used to it. So I'm, I'm pretty immune, not totally, but pretty immune to it. But really with most people, it's an adenosine antagonist. So 90 to 120 minutes uh, after waking is a good time to get your first caffeine in and then avoid caffeine after 4 p.m. if you're sensitive to it. And it depends on you. So it's a very personal thing, try that out. But if you're having any type of trouble sleeping, this is one of the levers that you got to play with to see if this might be causing that. Food when you eat early in the day is better because metabolism and temperature increase. Watch what you eat and watch your volume, of course. So yes, when you, you want to kind of go to bed on a not full stomach, you don't want the blood to be rushing there. You don't want your temperature to be up high, you want your temperature to start coming down your core temperature. So with a stomach full of food, that's going to be hard. All these will help your circadian clock. Predictable autonomic timing helps you sleep. Exercise in the morning, first thing. So, so I'm talking about when the best times are. So first thing in the morning is a good time to exercise three hours later or 11 hours later. Those are the op most optimum time. And then for you, look at it where it best suits you. Training before, right before bedtime is not a good idea. Just because your body is at, you know, full, full power at that point, your adrenaline is jacked, your temperature is going to be way high. So it's going to really take a lot of time for everything to come down for you to go to sleep. So not a good one. So the first part, middle of the day is your second critical time. Okay. Middle of the day is it good. You know, we get asked, is it good to kind of be Spanish and take a nap? Yes, it is. <laughs> the research show 90 minutes or less, not too late. It's really good. One of the things you can do instead of doing a nap is look at the reverie app, which is developed by David Siegel from Stanford, Dr. David Siegel. It is, there's a fee attached to it, but it's, you know, based in science, really good, gets you to a deeper rest in your body. And then you can also do an NS, a DR script or have a meditation practice that you use. So these are all good to have in the middle of the day to kind of reset, recharge, you know, for the rest of the time. So 5 p.m. to bedtime would be your third critical period. Get some natural light. It's good to look at the sunset, uh, the sun going down. This is another trigger for your circadian rhythm. You know, you're, you, 
detect at this point the different wavelengths of the light. So light has different wavelengths and different color depending on what time of day it is. In the morning it has a certain color and wavelength and in the evening when you're going down. Your body knows this and your circadian rhythm is triggered and connected to it. So this is, this is, and you know, in the description below we'll have some sunlight or light studies to look at. So in the late evening after six, we have to avoid bright artificial light. Once the sun goes down, dim the lights in your environment, keep them low. And low, but I mean low to the ground. You want to avoid lights coming from above because that also triggers. So artificial light coming from above actually goes into your eyes at the bottom and triggers this thing of, hey, it's day, it's daytime. We don't want that. We want light, if it is at all, a dim light coming from, kind of like sunset, from low up into your eyes. It's better, it's getting us ready for bed. So we have to do everything to really get us, you know, ready for bed. Dim your computer, you know, candlelight and moonlight are the best. I mean, that really works with our circadian clock, but I know we don't all do that. We watch a movie at night and, you know, we have other things we want to do. We want to work on the computer. Where bright light will kill the melatonin hormone in your body. So avoid it between absolutely avoid it between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. when we're sleeping. So really we need to sleep in an environment that's dark. Your room needs to be super dark. You don't want any lights, your phone, everything. When you go to the bathroom, make sure there's dim lights. Don't put the lights on. Do not mess up your sleep. Going to the bathroom is okay. If you can go, come back to bed and get back into bed without getting exposed to a strong light without looking at your telephone or your computer or having anything you know break your cycle so this is this is a big one so one I think one of the other things that we looked at is lowering your cold temperatures low lowering your core temperature before going to to bed now logically you would say okay this would be cold shower or you know cold water no our body works opposite so a sauna or a hot bath would be perfect because actually in reaction to that and not for a long long time but you know shorter time in reaction to a hot sauna or hot bath our body our core temperature cools us down it needs to cool down so it helps in the cooling down lowering that temperature in the morning however when we want to increase our body temperature, it's great to do a cold shower because then your body just goes <laughs> and it's, you know, with the cold shower, there's the shock, the adrenaline release and, and your body starts warming up. So it's kind of opposite to instinct. Okay, so we talked also about being, when you're, when you're asleep, it's important to keep your temperature cool. So if you're under the covers to be able to put your hand out or your foot out because that's where you have your glabrous skin and that's where you cool your core. So we talked about this before is that when you're in the desert and it's extremely hot, you're almost dying, someone hands you a cold towel or hands you like, yeah, a couple of cold towels, what do you do with it? Well, our instinct would be, okay, put it on my head and my neck, wrong. Where you're able to influence your core temperature the most and the quickest is right under your cheeks palms of your hands, where you have the glaber skin, or on the bottom of your feet. So that's where you get that trigger. So when you are sleeping at night and we need to cool down, it's easy to put our hand out from under the sheets or our feet out. And so this helps. So also we talked about how caffeine can disrupt sleep, how alcohol can disrupt sleep, but you also have CBD and THC. These are all also sleep disruptors. So really look at when, how you're taking this, if you're taking it, and, and look at what's, what's going on with the sleep. So what else is there? Well, we've got some supplements that seem to, and I'll start out with 145 milligrams of magnesium trionate. This might give you gas, so play with it if you, if you need it. 100 to 400 milligrams. If you, have, if you get bad dreams or something like that, 
also look at that and stop with it. 50 milligrams of pigenin. And this you should take 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. So I think the other options are to add glycine or GABA once in a while, not every day. And I think the one thing that you can add to the, if you're using the magnesium trinate and you're using, you know, some of the stuff, thionine or apigenin, add 900 mill milligrams of inositol. And that's every other day. It helps with falling asleep. It helps with it's falling asleep when you wake up in the middle of the night. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, how, what about melatonin? If you don't have to, don't use it. Two higher doses, dosages have shown to interfere with your hormone, you know, the hormones in your body. So it's just one that I'd rather you not use. And if you use, be very careful, you know, make sure you read up on it. And melatonin, I usually don't suggest. So that was it, that, that is, and this, as you can see, it's a calm, it's a calm episode because we're talking about sleep, but a super important one. Thank you, see you next time. Subscribe, ring the bell notification, and looking forward to our 12th episode, The Foundation Work.